Hello. Um, this is Gleam's Journey on the Beam. This is Haley. I'm Louis. Uh, lovely to see you. Good morning. So, uh, who am I? I'm a Beamer. I'm a big time fan of uh, Elixir and Erlang. I think they're both fantastic. And I've built my career off of the Beam Virtual Machine and its community. Um, but I'm mostly here because I made Gleam. But this talk's not really just about Gleam. It's actually more about all of us, about uh, the Beam, the ecosystem, the technology, all of it, because it's all really one thing, I think. And it's been a very long journey since the beginning of the Beam. It all started back in the 80s. Uh, Erlang sort of started in 1986 at Ericsson. And we've been on a long journey, and lots of things have happened, and we are here today. And we've got not just Erlang, we've got Elixir, and we've got LFE, and Gleam, and Affine, and Alpaca, and all these sorts of things. Fantastic. But where did Erlang come from? I think it came from one very clever little idea, one observation that was very smart. Perhaps something about concurrency? Perhaps something about fault tolerance? It was actually that software is really expensive. So, so, so expensive. So Ericsson being a company that's mostly known for um, making hardware, realized that their software costs were exceeding their hardware costs, which seems a little unintuitive. and was quite surprising at the time. And so in response to that, being a company, a bit wanting to make money and care about their costs, they founded the Computer Science Lab. And the purpose of this computer science lab at Ericsson was to improve the efficiency of developing software for their telecom systems. And that means making it easier to make software, faster to make software, cheaper to make software, and also to maintain it as well. And it's honed on telecom software specifically. It's not for anything else. And what does that mean? Well, that means it's got a niche set of requirements um, that you don't find anywhere else. Mm, maybe not. And that is that you know, people need to, need to be able to make telephone calls all hours of the day, day or night. You, know, you need to be able to talk to your boss in the day. You want to be able to talk to your loved ones uh, in the evening when you're not at work and on the weekend. So you can't have opening hours and closing hours. It's got to be highly available. And it's not acceptable for you to be halfway through that conversation and you just to lose the connection because something's gone wrong somewhere. It has to be highly resilient. And this was the 80s, so phones are still growing. More and more people are connecting. More and more people need to talk to each other. The whole world needs to talk, so it needs to be able to scalable. It needs to be able to scale to the entire planet, larger than any other system. So scalability is another extremely important factor. And this software is deployed to hardware that we want to use for as long as possible. And it may be deployed to places that are hard to access out in the fields. And so you can't have someone go to it and you know, manually change things or replace it in order to meet the new needs of the system. So it needs to be maintainable and upgradable, uh, preferably from a distance. So these are, are you know, at the time, a very niche set of requirements. And it was all focused on those things. And I think this makes Erlang kind of interesting from, um, for a functional language especially, because it's not exploring theory. They didn't say, oh, the actor model's fascinating. What can we do if you turn that into a language? How can we apply that? And they weren't trying to make a general tool so that you know, they could apply this to anything. They were focused on solving their specific business problem. And so at the beginning of this journey, we had a, a tool a language, uh, an environment, a runtime that was extremely specific and just for telecom software. So who is, who is using Erlang for telecom software today? A few people, but not the majority, not, you know, quite, a, quite a little group for all the people in this room. These days, this thing that was very specific has broadened it out and become really rather general. We've got people using it for web, we've got people using it for ML, we're doing all sorts of different things with it, embedded systems, etc. Uh, making spaceships explode with Lua. You know, lots of things are happening. So how did this happen? What, was, what happened on this long journey that made us go from being something that's extremely focused to being really rather general and resulted in us all coming together here? 
And I think you can look across the timeline and you can identify times when people did things that made the beam world grow just that little bit bigger. And I think the earliest one that was really impactful was back in uh, 1998 when Erlang was open sourced. Because Erlang was a proprietary language and you could only really use it for, for you know, things that Ericsson wanted you to use it for. But now, if you had the know-how, you could take it and you could do anything you want with it. And this happened, I think, I mean, I wasn't there, but I think because of um, there was a growing interest or growing preference for non-proprietary languages within Ericsson. Okay, they need to adapt to that. But also, people from the outside had heard about the amazing success they'd had uh, with, with Erlang. And, you know, what, what was this magical technology that meant you could achieve nine nines of uptime? And with this, the, the gate was opened and, and uh, the ecosystem really exploded, I think. And in 2001, yours came about, which I think is the first Erlang HTTP server, um, which I think to all of us seems quite mundane now. It's, it's very obvious you would use Erlang in the beam for HTTP. But I think at the time it was seen as really rather weird, very strange. I think Verding said uh, at the um, last code beam, didn't know why you would ever want to use Erlang for a web server. And it had a very novel, at the time, design where it could handle HTTP requests concurrently. Everything was always done sequentially at the time. And this meant that we could scale in ways that um, was challenging with established technology. And in the same year, Perhaps less impactfully, we branched out in another space. We went into uh, desktop GUI development with Wings 3D and also 3D modeling. So this hasn't caught on in the same way, but I think it's really cool. Uh, and I think it also predates WH Widget, so they had to like, make their own uh, GUI framework and stuff like that. Really, really cool stuff. 2002, eJabberDee, we've moved from uh, communicating with our voices to communicating with text. So eJeopardy is a text and presence server that implements XMPP. And I think today it is the most widely deployed XMPP server uh, in the world. So it's having huge waves there. Fast forward into 2004, we've got databases started to come up. It's an area that we've had loads of success with, with React. We heard about Open React yesterday. There's Couch, CouchDB as well, and um, all the RabbitMQ folks, that that's, shares a lot in common with a database. Um, again, that's the Erlang world growing bigger and bigger and bigger into areas it wasn't really thought of as being for. And in 2008, something that makes me really excited happened. It wasn't just that we're moving into new uh, problem spaces. We're not just moving into new domains. We're actually changing the way that we use these tools to solve problems. We've got a whole new language. So LFE is very... Erlang related, it's Lisp flavor Erlang after all, but it's very Lisp inspired. It's got that Lisp syntax. It has uh, interpreted macros, meaning that at compile time, the compiler can evaluate code and use that to build more code that will eventually be baked into the Beam bytecode. And that was followed up rather quickly, well, a few years later, by the juggernaut Elixir. Uh, which, again, has macros, but rather than being interpreted macros, it has a really interesting design where it compiles to a module and then it executes that module to expand the macros again, so it uses the full beam to um, iterate until the macros are all expanded. So, again, Lisp-inspired, this time, I think, more closure than uh, older Lisps. And it has lots of Ruby influences, you know, the, the syntax that we all like and um, this sort of modern tooling and modern sensibilities towards libraries and web development and this sort of thing. Oh, and I should say that um, Joxa also had this same macro system, but sadly that's not really used very much anymore, I think. Nerves and Scenic, I'm lumping these two together. Perhaps that's unfair, but I thought this is a, this is a really neat thing that you can do together and um, enables them to branch out into new areas. So NERVS being a, a lovely system for making embedded systems uh, in, in Elixir or Erlang uh, or Beam languages. And Scenic is a, a, a GUI framework, so like pointing back to the Wings 3D days, I think. And you can use this to make point-of-sale systems. That's a really exciting place that um, the ecosystem is growing into. And one rather modern one I just want to touch on now is Numerical Elixir. I think this one's really interesting. So this, so we are not 
regarded as being particularly good at maths on the beam. That's not really one of the strengths of our technology. But if you use numerical elixir, you can take a subset of elixir and you can compile it to code that runs on a GPU or a CPU, and you can get excellent uh, tensor mass performance. And this enables us to do sorts of ML things that we couldn't do before. But this is particularly interesting because we name ourselves Beam. This, this is code Beam. Uh, and that's the name of the runtime, but it's the name of all of us. And this is undeniably a Beam project. It's Elixir, but it's not running on the Beam. So somehow we are moving beyond the, the namesake of the ecosystem. So we're growing in all sorts of different ways and becoming more general and, and um, richer, I think. So somehow we've gone from, in the 80s, doing just telecoms, so now we're doing machine learning and AI as well. How did this happen? Through these set of incremental steps, through people going, I'm going to try that thing, I'm going to do something new, and we'll just see what happens. Now, I should talk about this one. I think everyone expects me to talk about this one. This is another way in that we've expanded, um, because I had a programming style that I loved in other languages that I missed whenever I was, whenever I was using the Beam, you know, my, my main love. So what is Gleam? It's a language. Most importantly, it has uh, curly braces. That's the main difference between it and the existing Beam languages. But it also has uh, a focus on static analysis and um, types and all that sort of jazz, and tries to be really easy to learn. First popped up in 2018 with the first release, and we had our uh, stable release this year, so really exciting year for, for um, those of us in pink. And yeah. So, a few years back, we had an interesting moment where Peter, who was here somewhere, um, decided to do, hello Peter, <laughs> decided to do the same thing that Numerical Elixir did for Elixir um, to Gleam, and that is make it possible to run a subset of it on a different runtime, so we can run our Beam programs in a different place, and that is uh, compiling to JavaScript, and that means we can run our Gleam code. Uh, in a browser, for example. And I'll pass over to Haley to talk more about that side of the story. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, cool. Um, hi, thank you, Louis. My name's Haley. Um, contrary to somewhat popular belief, I didn't make Gleam. <laughs> but uh, I am a member of the Gleam core team. And I'm also the author of a front end web framework for Gleam called Luster. And just for the avoidance of doubt, that isn't a picture of me, but that is a picture of my two cats, Haskell and Ada. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk about my own journey to the Beam. As someone maybe even just a few years ago was like staunchly front-end focused, didn't know the back-end, didn't want to know the back-end. Um, and I want to talk about some of the points in Gleam's development history that were significant to me, and I think significant to other members of our community. And I also want to talk about how my journey to the Beam has influenced my development of this framework called Luster. Before Gleam, there was darkness. <laughs> OK, I'm just kidding, obviously. Um, but before I joined the Gleam community, um, I had a very different background. I was a PhD student studying music, computing, and programming languages. Uh, I had a background in creative coding. But when I joined the Gleam community, almost exactly four years ago, actually, at the end of October 2020, I knew maybe three things. Um, I knew JavaScript, and I knew front-end frameworks, and the hellscape of JavaScript build tooling, and all of that pain. I also loved Elm, and I knew functional programming, and particularly this kind of pure, statically typed variant. And I knew Louis. Um, by sheer coincidence, I had met Louis at a house party through a mutual friend. And as one does, we spent the entire night just talking about programming languages. <laughs> but there's something missing from that list of things that I knew. I didn't know Erlang. And for a fledgling gleamling back in 2020, this turned out to be a bit of a problem. Um, Yes, you could compile Gleam code to Erlang. That bit worked. That was great. But if you actually wanted to run your program, you really needed to go a bit further. You knew you need the, the Beam, the virtual machine, and maybe you would have guessed that you needed an Erlang compiler somehow. But you also needed Rebar, 
back then, Gleam wasn't its own build tool. And instead, we had to lean on the rest of the ecosystem and the rest of the community to actually build and run our projects. And for someone like me that was really, really not embedded in this space before coming to Gleam, this was too much of a hurdle. And so for a long time, I lurked in the community and helped others that were interested in learning. And back then, that community was mostly made up of other curious beamers. Um, Gleam wasn't the only language promising static types on the beam. And so we had a lot of users that were interested in seeing how Gleam, this new technology, was weighing up against some of the other names that they already knew. Names like Alpaca or Caramel, Hamler. But I think things start getting really interesting at that moment that Louis already mentioned. Um, this pull request is dated November 2020, but actually, this didn't land in a compiler release until the middle of the next year, in June 2021. And this, I think, really started increasing Gleam's recognition beyond the beam. I think, I can't quite remember, but I think this might have been the first time a Gleam-related post made it to the front page of Hacker News, um, which may or may not be a good thing, depending on your relationship to the internet. But this kind of really started to take off because the JavaScript community is quite accustomed to compile to JavaScript languages. I mean, like this list is way, way longer. And so we had a lot of people curious and willing to try out Gleam. But just like Erlang, the state of Gleam in 2021 for a JavaScript user was, OK, great. Gleam could technically compile to JavaScript, as long as you were OK writing this arcane rune and invoking an Eldritch beast. If you needed any dependencies or you had external libraries, you'd list them all out one by one with this lib option. And then when you finally got your program running, you realized that 90% of the standard library was only implemented in Erlang FFI. So you're kind of, you've got a big order of wheels to reinvent. But if you were curious and willing, like I was back then, you could already start to build something interesting. And so one of the first applications I built in Gleam was this project I called Gleam Playground. It's kind of an awful name in hindsight, but you know, it wasn't meant to be shared, really. Um, and it was a creative coding framework leaning on my existing background, mainly to do SVG animation in the browser and with an incre incredibly generous helping of FFI to get me along the way. Now, these creative coding frameworks, they kind of all share a very similar architecture or structure. So you would define some sort of global state like a float here called x. And you would have a setup function that runs at the beginning of your program to initialize that state. You'd have some sort of continuously running update function to mutate it. And then you would have a draw function to show something on the screen. And this is exactly what I did for Gleam Playground. I realized that although Gleam was immutable, I could return new versions of state from this update function, and I could pass it to this draw function and I could just manage all of the messy mutation in internal FFI code. And this was actually, by coincidence, or unexpectedly, I should say, a prototype for what Luster would become. And there were quite a few of us at this time that were happily kind of playing with Gleam and experimenting. But there was relative quiet from the compiler releases at this time. Now, we don't work to a kind of fixed release schedule, but we did kind of settle into a fairly natural cadence of, say, six to eight weeks for compiler releases. But we only had two more releases that year from that JavaScript release back in June. And at the very end of the year, a really exciting release happens, and the Gleam build tool releases. This means now we can get rid of rebar and we can start compiling Erlang projects ourselves. We can scaffold new projects. We can add dependencies with proper dependency resolution. We have a test runner. All these really, really exciting things. And this meant we kind of did a rug pull on all of those JavaScript developers that had come and were interested in compiling to JavaScript. Because suddenly, now they had a really, really easy way to write and run programs on the beam. When I made this slide, I didn't really consider that you might have to squint to see this. So <laughs> it's very subtle. But you can see that when we release that build tool, the number of packages that people start publishing, which I think is a good um, analogy for how many people are interested in building, starts to tick upward. I mean, 
Obviously, ignore the really impressive tick at the end. Like, that's more impressive, but we're not here to talk about that right now. And it was after this, um, just a month after this, actually, that the build tool also really reaches feature parity with the JavaScript backend. And so now all of those really nice things that we were experiencing for less than a month, actually, for the Erlang backend came to JavaScript too. And then it wasn't long after that that I started building Lustre. The Lustre leans again into that architecture that I was familiar with from creative coding frameworks. And so you have some program state and a function to initialize it. You have an update function that receives messages, and then you update that state. And then, of course, we have a view function that has now gone from just SVG to you know, the DOM in general. But this is the cool bit to me. This was the bit that I really liked about Elm, was that now we had these messages that very precisely described all of the ways the outside world could talk to my program. And if I wanted to see what my program could do, I just needed to look at this type and maybe my update function. And Lustre quite quickly developed a small but rather passionate community of users. But what confused me at the time was that most of these users were Beamers and not the JavaScript developers that we had started courting. I have some ideas about why that might be now. Back then, I really didn't. It was kind of confusing. I first kind of shared Lustre to the world outside of the Gleam Discord publicly last year at FOSDEM in February. There, my goal for that talk was to show that full-stack web development in Gleam was entirely possible. This was something that you could already do today. And I wanted to give an example of a typed communication layer between the front end and the back end. The thing that I had developed was this kind of collaborative music application. So it's a step sequencer goes along and it plays notes every time a square is activated. But this was multiplayer or multi-user, and so you could have multiple connected clients all playing with the same piece of music. And that kind of vision for front and back end communication very abstractly looked a bit like this, where you could have a message that your client sends to the back end and then you have a type for messages that the, the back end can send back to the front end. And you could do this pretty much entirely in Gleam. I had a slide in that talk where I showed maybe the entire project was 300 lines of Gleam and maybe 80 lines of JavaScript. And that JavaScript was just for the audio stuff. I then gave a kind of refined or developed version of that talk last year at CodeBeam. And while I was working on that talk and working on Lustre in general, I came to the slowest realization. It's probably very obvious for the people in this room. This is the Elm architecture or the model view update architecture. It's what Elm uses. It's what Lustre uses. It's what some other front end frameworks use. And I realized this thing kind of looks an awful lot like this other thing that I was doing when I was working on the WebSocket server. And so one of the things I started to pivot my talk to for CodeBeam was that these are the same thing, kind of, like not technically, but conceptually. And I thought that was really exciting because the angle here was that I could empower Beamers to feel like they could start building applications on the front end, even though maybe they weren't so familiar with something like React. That was maybe intimidating, weird, confusing, complicated. But this was leaning on those verbs and patterns that you were probably already familiar with. But of course, these aren't the same thing. But could they be? This was really nagging me, OK? Like, at this point, I was maybe familiar enough with the beam to be dangerous, not familiar enough to build you know, like planet scale applications, but enough to know that there's something to this idea. And of course, there was prior art. Um, Phoenix LiveView had already proven that this was possible and it was productive. I mean, people were shipping really, really non-trivial applications with LiveView, and they've been doing so for quite a long time. And there was also a Gleam library called Sprocket 
that had demonstrated that typed live views were already a thing. Sprocket was developed by someone that goes by the name Bitbuilder on the Gleam Discord and on GitHub. And they truly are my hero. Um, they contributed the first kind of prototype of what Lustre's runtime could look like on the beam. And so I just really want to give a shout out to their project. I think actually, you know, some healthy competition is nice. And I'd really like, if you're interested in maybe an entire live view thing that runs exclusively on the back end, you should check out Sprocket. You can check out their documentation and, of course, their GitHub. But compared to these things, Lustre had maybe a secret weapon. These are, the, these are the main building blocks of a Lustre application. Now, this is the third time I'm talking about it. I'm sure you get the idea. These kind of get wrapped up and abstracted into a single type called an app. But what's interesting about this app type is it doesn't tell you anything about where it runs. So a Lustre app could be a single page application running entirely on the client, or it could be a custom element, a web component, or it could be a server component running on the beam, or it could be a server component running on some JavaScript backend as well. And the power here is that these compose, and so you could have an app that is a single page application, and inside it, it renders an Erlang server component, and inside that, it renders a custom element. And in this way, I think Lustre is bridging the gap between front end and the beam. Not necessarily in a technical sense, although I think there is a case for that too. But in a sense that Lustre is kind of working, or I hope will work, as a kind of double-ended funnel where we caught JavaScript front end developers to start building in this new exciting architecture. And then they realize, well, I've already built a thing in this Lustre thing. Maybe I, maybe I can just move this to the Beam and start playing around there. And similarly, Beamers can build their applications entirely as server components, never leave the world of the Beam. And then when they're ready, they can start branching out and build small components for their application that run entirely on the client, but without changing languages, without changing tooling, and without changing that base architecture. But Lustre isn't unique in this regard. There are other Gleam projects, and of course there's the Gleam language itself that is bringing new ideas to the beam. And to talk a bit more about that, I'm gonna hand back to Louis. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. So, I think we've just seen um, that having uh, Lustre can bring new people to the beam, and doing a wider array of things can bring new people into uh, our ecosystem. And that's obviously a good thing. If we have more people, that they can um, enjoy all these wonderful things that we've got inside our ecosystem and take advantage of the strengths of our technology and the, the strengths of our community. And also, just having more people means there's more people to um, contribute to our open source projects. There's more people to hire into our companies. There's more people to work with and share a coffee with at the, at the hallway track. Um, but one aspect of this I want to focus on that may be not quite as obvious is that when you bring in new people, you bring in new ideas. It's very easy, I think, to uh, be a beamer and be really aware of what our strengths are and to be quite focused, much in the same way that Erlang was very focused in the beginning, on what those things are. Like, we're really good at web. We do a lot of web. We do web fantastically. We're really good at telecoms. We're really good at chats. We're really good at these sort of things. But there may be things that we're not so good at that we just don't consider, because it's not something we do. But if someone from a different background, that's not quite so obvious. So they may do these things which perhaps we wouldn't do anyway. And that can enable us to grow in new ways and continue to get stronger. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Erica Rowland, a lovely member of the uh, Gleam community, she's got a uh, background that involves Go development. So when she came to Gleam and the Beam, she really liked it. And one thing she wanted to use it for was uh, terminal user interface developments. Because in Go, that's something they do a lot of. 
And here is a, uh, a library called Bubble Tea, which enables you to make these really lovely terminal user interfaces. And I can think of lots of ways that I would like to use this. We can use this for development tooling. We can use this to like really quickly give like little UIs to give to people, wrap them up in an e-script, and share them around. Awesome. Really nice experience. So she went out, not knowing what we don't do in the Beam, and just started making it. She made this lovely uh, recreation of it called Tea Shop in Gleam. Um, but there was a problem. She had to use the JavaScript backend. She had to compile Gleam to JavaScript in order to make this. She wasn't able to use the Beam. Why was that? Well, that's because the way that I.O. works on the Beam you don't have enough access to standard input to be able to handle individual key press events. You can't press up and get a message saying somebody's pressed up. And so if you look around, there's some people who've tried to work around this before, and they've done this using NIFs. So we tried all the different NIFs, but they all introduced latency, or there was various different problems, or they didn't work anymore. But perhaps most importantly, it doesn't really work with an e-script, because you can't take a NIF and bundle it up and give it to your user and expect it to work. You need to have like a complicated install process, which kind of defeats the point of you know, what this, this area is going for. So what do you do when you've got a problem with something sort of complicated and beamy? You go to the Erlang forums, and Lucas came to the rescue saying, yes, we do want to do this. And there isn't really a solution for this at the moment, but here is a, uh, an unstable API that you could use, um, which you know, will work today, but may change in future. Like, that's OK. That's a good, that's a good trade-off. We can do that now. And then later on, when we've got the full API, we can use that. And because this is all public on the Erlang forums, it was noticed by some Erlangers. And J.R. Fondren, who uh, is a name I don't know if I'm pronouncing right, very sorry, immediately popped up a few hours later saying, I've made a game in Erlang that runs in the terminal. Fantastic. So we've had a Go person come to Gleam, and then we've gone to the Erlang forums, and now Erlang are doing stuff as well. Look at all this excitement. Look at all these new ideas. And uh, Gary Gasler of the Phoenix Core team started doing the same in um, Elixir off the back of this forum post. I think this is really cool. We've, we've found a way to attract somebody into our ecosystem who doesn't have our preconceptions, and they've immediately sparked a bunch of growth and activity and ideas and new things being played with, and we're possibly going to get some new Beam APIs and that sort of thing. That's awesome. But what about all this duplication? Someone did something in Gleam, and then we did it again in Erlang, and then we did it again in Elixir. Isn't that wasteful? It, it, sort, it kind of is, really. We could have all just done it in Erlang, or we could have all just done it in Elixir, or we could have all just done it in Gleam. And then perhaps we would have got three times far, or maybe twice as far. You know, not waste this extra development effort. So is this a problem? To answer this question, I think we need to look at another very important piece of research that was happening in the same year Erlang was created, in 1986. And this was uh, Howard Moskowitz, who was employed by the Campbell Soup Corporation to find out what is the perfect soup. Because if we find out what the perfect soup is, everyone will buy it, and we'll make loads of money and be really rich. That was the idea. And he was the man for the job, because he's the man who worked out how much fat you should put in spaghetti. That's true. <laughs> so we did loads of research, um, and he came to the conclusion that there isn't a perfect soup. Not everyone's going to like the same thing. And it's quite obvious, really. Everyone has different tastes, different preferences. Some people are going to like a nice, chunky elixir soup. Some people are going to like a nice, creamy Erlang soup. You can't make one thing and expect to make everybody happy. If you, the soup corporation, or perhaps the Beam ecosystem, want to be able to draw in as many people as possible with different tastes and backgrounds and preferences, you need to give them different options. And that's why it's great that we have this growing, vibrant set of selections. Like, you can use Erlang, you can use Elixir, you can use Gleam, you can use LFE. And I think, uh, or rather, people have asked me repeatedly, um, doesn't creating Gleam draw people away from Elixir? And I don't think that's the case. 
And we've got some data on that now. So we did, a couple of weeks ago, a survey of the Glim community, and we asked people, what language did you come from? And when I was putting this out, lots of people replied saying, oh, it's going to all be Elixir, isn't it? But Elixir came in fourth place. More people came from Python, more people came from Rust, and way more people came from TypeScript. And that kind of makes sense, because those are languages with similar sensibilities to Gleam. And the people who like those languages, but are being curious, may look at Erlang and Elixir and say, that's not quite my cup of tea. And now we've given this new option, they come on board and we grow the beam. And if you split it into people who are beamers and people who are not beamers, who are now actively engaging in um, this bit of the Gleam community, 90% of the respondents didn't come from the beam. So by giving a, a new option, we've grown the ecosystem. We've given people more reasons to come to us. So I think there's real value in this. So I think it's good to, to have new ideas and to uh, explore them and see where they go, even if it seems like something that uh, may not be possible or it seems like something that may not be particularly useful. I remember when I was starting Gleam, lots of people would say, oh, it's impossible to make typed OTP. You just can't do it. Well, a few years later, um, going, well, it's pro they're probably true. It's probably right, but um, let's do it anyway. Let's see where we get. We've discovered there is, a, there is at least one productive way to type OTP. And I think with the upcoming work in Elixir and the work that's going on in type in Erlang, we're going to find multiple ways of doing this. So ignore these preconceptions take some ideas that are floating around the back head and just have fun and see where you can go. And then by doing this, we can continue to keep growing the Beam world, making it more general, moving into new areas and uh, give new businesses and new people and new problems space within our community. Thank you very much. I'm Louis. This is Haley. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, we have a lot of questions, and uh, luckily we have some time uh, to answer those questions. Uh, uh, the mostly voted question uh, on the Huvo app is uh, what kind of problems would be efficient uh, to solve with Gleam or Luster instead of other languages or frameworks? This may have been partially answered, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I, I think that you can apply Gleam really to any problem space that uh, Elixir or Erlang or LFE are really good at. I don't think that Gleam is about tackling new problem spaces. It's about giving you new ways to do it. So when, when you, or, or you or your team are picking a language, you, pick, you first look at um, the problem space, but you also look at your team. So it's the same things, but which one you pick depends on what your sensibilities are as a developer, I think. Anything about Lust? Yeah, I can just chime in on that a little bit. Uh, for Luster specifically, I think there is a very compelling problem that it solves, and that's the fact that different parts of your application really want to run on different parts of your stack. And so if you're using like React or some front-end framework, all of your code is stuck on the front-end, and you're back to doing you know, HTTP or something to communicate. And if you're using LiveView, then all of your code is running on the back-end, and you have to step out of Elixir and start writing JavaScript if you need client code. But the problem that Luster is solving, of course, is that you can just choose which bits of your Luster program run on which bits of the stack. OK, thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, could you please uh, provide some uh, debugging and profiling tools in Gleam? <laughs> As a new buy, uh, I find it hard all the time. Um, so those, those are runtime features, really. So anything that you can use in the Beam, you can use exactly the same in uh, Gleam. There's nothing stopping you from using all the excellent tools you've got today. The only caveat would be that they uh, largely use Erlang syntax, um, but that's just something you're going to have to get used to, I think. OK, thank you. Yeah, uh, there may be some questions here from the audience. Anyone? Um, I was wondering uh, about Luster specifically, if there are any examples um, of trying to glue uh, Luster code and live view uh, Phoenix uh, components or something like this. 
uh, are there, have there been any attempts and what has uh, come out of that? Um, actually, I think there has been at least one example of someone playing around with this idea. Um, there's, no, there's nothing like official, there's no official documentation around this. I think probably um, this would be not the best idea just because these two things have quite different mental models. And I mean, maybe if you were using Luster on the front end and uh, Phoenix Live View on the back end, perhaps, maybe it's like a live Svelte kind of deal. That could be interesting, but I'm not sure there are any examples right now. So about compiling Gleam to JavaScript, is there anything inherent in Gleam that makes that possible in the sense that it would not be possible in Erlang? Or could you, in theory, do an Erlang to JavaScript, like subset of Erlang to JavaScript compiler, or take some parts out of the Gleam like infrastructure and achieve that somehow? Uh, I think you definitely could compile uh, Erlang to JavaScript. And if you look at the history of Elixir, there was once a uh, Elixir is a JavaScript compiler. And once you've expanded all the macros, Elixir and Erlang are extremely similar languages. So you could take that same technique. One thing uh, to keep in mind with, though, is that con the concurrency model, like our wonderful processes, et cetera, is part of the language in both Erlang and uh, Elixir. So if you want to compile those to JavaScript, you, will, you make a choice. And that choice is, uh, are you going to sacrifice that portion of the language and not port it over to JavaScript and you're going to use the JavaScript currency model, or are you going to uh, implement that on top of JavaScript currency model, um, which you, know, you, may, you may, may or may not have success with. If you do that, you're going to sacrifice interop with um, the JavaScript concurrency system as a whole, and you're also going to be shipping rather a large runtime. So you may end up with, uh, say, front-end applications, which work and are nice to write, but there's a very significant startup cost to them where your users have downloaded a lot of data before they can do anything. So it's a difficult trade-off. Gleam has gone, gone for um, not replicating the concurrency model, mostly so we can have better interop with uh, front-end systems and so we can have like really tiny bundle sizes. Thank you.